given what we're seeing in the courts so far today, it's hard to know exactly what kind of regulation of firearms, at least direct re regulation of firearms, would be constitutionally permissible. You're listening to Talking About Guns, or TAG, as we like to call it. My name is Matt Littman, Executive Director of 97%. We're a new bipartisan organization working to reduce gun deaths in America. As part of our mission to change the conversation around gun safety, TAG normalizes dialogue about guns. We invite guests from all sides of the gun debate and talk about the hot-button issues, but without the screaming. Today, we're joined by one of the 20 most cited law professors in judicial opinions. His work, in fact, has been referenced in several landmark Supreme Court decisions. At UCLA, he specializes in gun policy in addition to constitutional law and the Supreme Court. The author of Gunfight, a history of the debate over gun regulation since America's founding, he is also a prolific op-ed writer whose pieces have appeared in publications such as The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, and The Atlantic. And fun fact, he's the son of Academy Award-winning Rocky producer Erwin Winkler. Professor Adam Winkler, welcome to TAG. Thanks so much for having me. So uh, you're the number one legal expert on guns in this country, it certainly seems to us. Uh, and there is so much going on in the courts now, and things have changed so drastically just over the last few months. Do you find that after the Supreme Court decision, which we'll talk about, and the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, which we'll talk about, do you find that people in the country are really aware of how different things are going to be on uh, gun issues and legal issues around guns? That there's I don't think so. Around. I think that when the Supreme Court issues a ruling like it did in NYSERPA versus Bruin in June of 2022, it gets a lot of attention from the public immediately. But the public doesn't necessarily get a great sense of the consequences of that decision, how it plays out in the lower courts. And what's happened in the last nine months since the Bruin case came down has really been a revolution in American gun policy. Nothing short of that. Uh, we have seen courts across the nation use the Bruin test uh, that's articulated by the majority in that case to strike down uh, an incredible uh, variety of laws uh, that I think even people who were very strong pro-gun advocates uh, are very surprised that uh, some of these cases are coming down. We've had courts strike down uh, the ban on domestic abusers subject to a restraining order struck down. We've seen courts strike down uh, the ban on um, having a firearm with an obliterated serial number. Uh, we've had courts strike down bans on guns in churches, bars, even summer camps. So we have really seen um, a lot of gun laws called into question in light of the Bruin case. And I don't think uh, um, the, the public really has a great understanding of what's happening. You know, I'm going to try to just give the overall of what happened but as I'm saying it, I feel like I'm playing basketball with Michael Jordan, and I'm going to try to dunk next to Michael Jordan when I'm explaining what the Supreme Court did when you're on the, when you're on tag. So basically, in the, what the Supreme Court did was they changed the test for what could happen on gun issues. In that previously, one of the tests was uh, if it was determined that uh, how do I phrase this properly that uh, that the Congress or the courts felt that the guns were dangerous in some way, there could be some uh, prohibition. Is that sort of correct? And then they changed it to, instead of that, it's basically if there was a precedent in the 17 or 1800s, that's the second test. Now, is that correct, basically? Yeah, that, that really gets at it. You know, traditionally, we say in America that none of our rights are absolute that um, uh, depending on uh, the need of the government to restrict rights uh, and how limited the government um, tries to restrict rights, so long as it doesn't restrict rights any more than necessary, uh, the courts will often allow that government law to stand. That's why we say, like, you can't sh falsely shout fire in a crowded theater. Even though that's arguably free speech, uh, the courts would say, well, government has a really strong reason in avoiding the chaos that would cr be created by uh, exercise of speech in that instance. And so for the last 14 years, since the Heller case was decided in 2008, that was the first Supreme Court case to clearly and unambiguously say that the Second Amendment protects an individual right to have firearms for personal protection. 
Uh, in the years that followed that case, um, there were hundreds um, uh, of challenges to gun laws across the nation, and the vast majority of those gun laws survived judicial scrutiny because the court said that the government had good reason to limit guns in this way, and the bans on guns that we had didn't really amount to significant restrictions on the right to bear arms. The Supreme Court in the Bruin case um, uh, did two things. The court first struck down New York's uh, permitting policy for concealed carry, saying that uh, New York, by giving uh, law enforcement officers discretion over who got a permit uh, to carry a firearm concealed, um, had violated the Second Amendment. Um, that was an important ruling that has an impact across about half a dozen or more states that have similar laws or had similar laws before that case was decided. But perhaps the far more important thing that the Bruin court did, uh, as you say, Matt, uh, the court um, adopted a new test for Second Amendment cases. And that new test says that gun laws today, to be constitutionally permissible, must be consistent with the gun laws of the 17 and 1800s when the Second Amendment was adopted and when the 14th Amendment, which expanded some rights to the states, including the Second Amendment, uh, was, adopted to the, uh, was uh, adopted and ratified to the Constitution. Uh, and as a result, courts that are confronting many gun laws that are modern 20th century inventions that are designed to respond to the problems of gun violence in a modern society. Uh, the courts are saying, well, does that gun law have an antecedent, a similar kind of law in place across the country in the 17 and 1800s? And most laws just can't survive that test. Right. So as we're getting into all this, and it's obvious you're an expert, I just have a question. There are a lot of amendments. How did you pick the Second Amendment to be an expert on? Well, you know, just going through the amendments. Start with the first, you got to move to the second. You know, next thing you know, I'm going to do a, a, a book on the third amendment to the Constitution, which is a, that government cannot quarter troops in your home. You know, uh, you know it, can, it can happen every day now. Your education, uh, so, yeah, could have gone a lot of different ways, but you pick this is not a uh, common uh, area of expertise for people. Well, and especially for a kid who grew up on the west side of Los Angeles, where there weren't a lot of guns and uh, didn't grow up in a gun culture or hunting culture. Um, but look, I'm a constitutional law professor, and I'm really interested in constitutional history. And uh, in the years before the Heller case was decided, uh, I thought, oh, wow, the Second Amendment, I want to really look into it and see what I can find and what the history really was. And what I found was really surprising. Um, I found um, uh, that... Uh, perhaps surprising me and my sort of uh, progressive upbringing, that there was a long history and tradition of gun rights in America. Uh, that no matter what you think about the proper interpretation of the Second Amendment, the states had long protected the right to bear arms, both as a matter of law in their state constitutions, and it's just a matter of practice, that we just didn't traditionally restrict people from having guns in America, um, uh, at least most people from having guns in America. And um, at the same time, I thought it was really interesting that although we've had uh, gun rights, we've also always had gun safety laws. And they're not the same kind of laws that we have today, which is causing a problem in the courts. Yeah. But there was a long history and tradition of gun safety efforts, too. And it was this balance that I thought was sort of missing in the debate that led me to write my book, uh, Gunfight, uh, and um, you know, try to set out uh, this very conflicting, complicated, and interesting his history of gun rights and gun regulation. I read that book. It helped guide me. I read that book a couple of years ago. And when I do my Zooms at From Home, it's right behind my head uh, when I'm on my Zooms. Um, uh, so then uh, you mentioned the Heller case. But even in that Heller case in the Supreme Court, uh, what was that, 15 years ago? I don't – was that 15 years yeah, ago? 2008. 2008. Yeah. 2008. Um, even in that case, they talked about the fact that there is a need for some type of regulation, right? And that this now this new case, this Bruin case, more recently, uh, that sort of there's there may be a need for regulation, but that regulation is based on such historical precedent that it makes it almost impossible to have regulation. Yeah, it makes it very difficult to have regulation because many of the the kinds of gun laws we had in the. 17 and 1800s just aren't really the same kind of gun laws that we have today. Um, you know, some of the things that we think are the centerpieces of modern gun policy uh, just didn't have any 
history in the 17 and 1800s. Think about bans on felons possessing firearms, people who have felony convictions. Well, we didn't have such laws uh, before the mid 1900s. Uh, what do we think about uh, restrictions on guns for people who are mentally ill? Well, those laws really started in the 1960s. Um, background checks for gun right. purchases. Again, the first significant background check we, law we had in the United States was uh, adopted in the 1990s. Um, and so these are not gun laws that have a strong basis in history and tradition. And there's good reason for that, because government didn't have the capacity to conduct background checks back in the 1700s and right. 1800s. Um, Some uh, would say they don't now. <laughs> yeah, and they don't. And it's difficult now. Even. Right. Um, but, um, you know, you didn't have computerized databases in right. the 1700s. Uh, if we think about even like machine guns, uh, you know, we didn't have easily portable automatic weapons in the 17 and 1800s. Well, no surprise, we didn't limit people's access to those weapons because they didn't really exist. That and is sadly, a neat, yeah. Sadly, Matthew, I think it's important that uh, m many of the gun laws we did have in the 17 and 1800s were designed for purposes of racism and to keep African Americans and other racial minorities as second class citizens. So we barred African Americans from possessing firearms. Um, those aren't the kinds of gun laws we want to have today, and the Supreme Court shouldn't force us to address modern gun problems solely with the tools that in, were in existence in the 17 and 1800s. So that's a neat segue to the second. So the Supreme Court made that decision a few months ago. Then the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, and I think you mentioned this before, on domestic violence, said if you have a domestic violence restraining order, you can, that does not preclude you from having a gun. And that's based on the fact that if we look at this new standard by the Supreme Court, Clarence Thomas, there weren't those laws in the 1700s. I don't, domestic violence probably wasn't even illegal in the 1700s or 1800s. And so that's why the Fifth Circuit, I'm speaking for you, but that's basically why they made that decision. Is that right? That's, that's exactly right. Uh, the court looked to history and tradition to see whether uh, the ban on domestic abusers subject to a restraining order uh, had historical antecedents in the 17 and 1800s. And unsurprisingly, the court found that there were no historical antecedents. You know, the truth, the truth be told, we didn't ban domestic violence uh, much in the 17 and 1800s. Uh, of course, there were uh, extreme cases that were prosecuted, but very few. Um, and Gun didn't, uh, government didn't have the capacity to go take those guns away from people who were convicted of domestic violence. And so the court said, look, when we look back at history and tradition, there's nothing there uh, that is similar to this law. So we have to strike this law down. One of the interesting things about your job must be that when the court makes that decision, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, you have to look back now and look to see if there was anything in the 17 or 1800s, right? Because that's your area. How do you even find that? <laughs> Well, I tell you, right now, uh, there has been, just over the last few years, uh, both because of the Supreme Court's new test and because of advocates' preparation for this test to be adopted, there were some signals by uh, Justices uh, Barrett and Kavanaugh when they were lower court judges that they were interested in this history and tradition-based mm -hmm. approach to the Second Amendment. Um, as a result of those hints and the new decision by the Supreme Court, we've seen far more research into the history of American gun laws than had ever existed in the 200 years before. Uh, and so there are databases. So for instance, the Duke Firearms Center has set up a database of historic gun laws that you can go in and search all the gun laws there. They've tried to be a comprehensive database. Um, and there's a whole bunch of scholars who are working in this area now. And indeed, because of this new history and tradition test, anyone who wants to learn about the history of gun laws, you just read the briefs in these cases and they're filled with historical evidence that no one had ever really thought to dig up before. So. Um, uh, it, my book, Gunfight, dug up some of this history, but it's much deeper and goes in many more directions than, than I ever discovered when I was doing my research. Uh, and I certainly wish that I had all of those resources available now. I was going to ask uh, you, do people call you when they're, because there are all these cases now moving forward all over the country. Do they call you for your expertise in these cases? They do. Certainly, certainly. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been. Uh, it's been a busy time since the Bruin case was decided. Uh, especially someone who does a little bit of Second Amendment history. Um, uh, there are 
um, lawyers on both sides of virtually every case that are looking for historians right. uh, and law professors to, to talk about these issues. I hate to ask this question. Do they pay for that? Is that a, do they pay you to be a witness or that kind of thing? Well, I mean, you can get paid if I were to work as an expert witness. I yeah. would get paid. Okay. Um, you know, it depends on who calls me, to be honest right. with you. Um, traditionally, you know, if I get called by um, uh, government lawyers, either for the prosecution or, as increasingly the case, from public defender's office who are defending people who are accused of crimes, I'll always do that work uh, free of charge. But um, if there's a, a lawyer who's working for a paying client, well, th then, uh, then generally I get paid as well. Fantastic. Um, all right. So then just so now, you know, when the president was at the State of the Union, Professor, he was talking about assault weapons bans and that sort of thing. And as I'm watching it, I'm thinking to myself, this does not reflect where we are today, given the Bruin case and the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals case. If you even try to ban assault weapons right now, I, I, based on what you're saying, I don't know that that could pass a court test, right? Well, I think that is really a, a big unanswered question, Matt, and we're just going to have to see how that plays out. I think that um, if I were a betting man, I'd probably bet, as you say, that the, so that the Supreme Court, if it gets a chance, will strike down a ban on assault weapons. Um, and it may get that chance. There are some states that have restricted assault weapons, including the state that, uh, that I'm in right now, uh, California. Um, and I think that, uh, again, when we look at history and tradition, it becomes harder to defend a restriction on assault weapons, although there were restrictions on various kinds of weaponry, even back in the day, um, we didn't have bans on assault weapons. Hey, surprise, Matt, that before assault <laughs> weapons were a thing and were commonly available to civilians and uh, civilians showed much interest in purchasing them, surprisingly, we didn't have any laws restricting access to them. Um, this is the real conundrum that uh, gun safety advocates uh, are confronting, is, is that uh, virtually all of the gun safety movement's top agenda items, bans on assault weapons, bans on high capacity magazines, red flag laws, universal background checks, um, none of those things have a clear basis in the gun laws of the 17 and 1800s. And so all of them are uh, really um, on thin ice when it comes to the, the courts. So let's take it maybe one at a time. So on, the, on that Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals with the domestic violence issue, I'm assuming that gets uh, appealed somewhere along the way, if it hasn't already. And is that, I saw a congressman a couple of weeks ago, professor, who said he thought that that ruling would not stand. Do you have the same point of view or a different point of view? I think it is possible. It's always hard to predict the future, so I don't like to be take too strong okay. a stand on such a thing. Um, but the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, ruling, um, I'm sure, will be petitioned to the en banc court of the Fifth Circuit, where they get the entire circuit, not just the panel of three judges, to rule on the issue. Um, but that's not a guarantee that the en banc court of the Fifth Circuit will take that appeal. If that, uh, if they don't, then the, the next stage is to appeal uh, a petition for certiorari in the Supreme Court, which I'm sure will happen uh, at some point. It's not clear. The court has dis discretionary jurisdiction. The, the court can choose which cases it wants to take or not. And it may take the Fifth Circuit Court uh, of Appeals ruling on domestic abusers, or it may just allow that ruling to stand. It's hard to predict. Um, I think there are some people in the gun world who think that Justices Kavanaugh and Chief Just Justice Kavanaugh and Chief Justice John Roberts um, may be less likely to uh, rule in uh, a more a rather extreme way on these gun issues and maybe a vote in favor of some gun safety laws. Um, but we don't really know. They did join Justice Thomas's majority opinion in Bruin that adopted this history and tradition test. And if all the six justices who joined that opinion are serious about applying that history right. and tradition test, then I think the domestic abusers ban is on uh, very, uh, very uh, shaky ground. The ban itself. So just to understand it, if they already decided with Thomas, Justice Thomas, that that was the way that this is going to go, how can they possibly then walk it back? In other words, if there was no, what would be the reason to walk that, that Fifth Circuit uh, decision back if you're the Supreme Court based on the fact that they said that there's this historical precedent? 
Well, I mean, it would be a matter of, you know, uh, giving up what you've already stated. Uh, you know, as, as my students in Constitutional Law 1 every year uh, learn uh, at UCLA Law School, um, trying to find perfect consistency among Supreme Court decisions is a fool's errand. Okay. And in fact, they may be marked more distinctively by their inconsistency than their consistency. So, uh, you know, when the court doesn't have any higher court to uh, for from which it, its decisions can be appealed, uh, we get inconsistency often. And so it could be that Justices Rob Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Kavanaugh might, um, uh, might decide that uh, the current Supreme Court test is being applied too aggressively by the lower courts and perhaps join with the liberals in articulating uh, the three lib most liberal justices and articulating uh, an, a softer test or softening the current history and tradition test. It's not clear exactly how it's going to happen or if it will happen, but it is possible that you could see the court uh, revising that test in another Second Amendment case um, uh, that might come up in the near future. So even if it got turned over, for example, in the Fifth Circuit, when uh, it would still possibly still go up to the Supreme Court, is that correct? And then when you say that there's no higher court, they could be as inconsistent as they want to be because there's nowhere to go. Is that right? That's basically it, right? Okay. OK, um, so then if you are a legislator in Congress or in the states and you want to do something on gun issues, what can you possibly do? In other words, you mentioned red flag laws, which I did not think were as much risk as maybe universal background checks. Um, but but are you saying that what? Well, let me ask you, what laws are there any laws that the government can pass at this point? that would stand the test of the courts? So I, I think that um, uh, any government regulation of firearms and gun owners directly is going to be questionable in the courts. Now, that's not to say there's not any law that you can find an an, a good analogy to in the 17 and 1800s, but given what we're seeing in the courts so far today, it's hard to know exactly what kind of regulation of firearms, at least direct re regulation of firearms, would be constitutionally permissible. Um, uh, think about bans on military-style uh, assault rifles. Uh, think about bans on high-capacity magazines. Um, uh, we might think about um, uh, other laws that are attempting to regulate guns um, uh, that uh, are uh, restrictions on concealed carry, for instance, in terms of where sensitive places where guns can't be brought. I think, for instance, that's an area where we've seen New York uh, and New Jersey and California is on the on pre precipice, perhaps, of passing new laws right. identifying what are uh, what the Supreme Court calls sensitive places, places where guns can be banned, even though people have a right to carry guns generally. Um, I definitely think there are some sensitive places, laws that will be upheld, although it should be noted that the, in New York, which uh, uh, enacted a law that created a whole new list of sensitive places, um, uh, a, a federal judge came in and struck down most of them already. So it, it's even difficult to find space there. I would say that there are things that you can do to reduce gun violence that don't target specifically guns and gun owners. Well, let's get to that in a second. So, okay. so but if you're... so. You know, our organization, we do talk about state background checks. We do talk about red flag laws. <clears throat> and that's, I think part of it is, even if the states pass these laws, some of these laws, by the time it gets to the court, I think this is the thinking in some of these states, by the time it gets to the courts, where it might possibly overturned, be overturned, that takes a long time. Is that right? Yeah. OK, because it doesn't happen immediately that a court hears this, somebody petitions that, you know what I mean? Like the whole process takes a long time. So some of these states may feel like we're going to save lives in the meantime and then let somebody sue us. And then in two years, we'll go to court. Well, it's actually the problem is, is that um, what gun owners can uh, what gun rights advocates are doing is they're filing lawsuits before the law even goes into effect. And because of Bruin, because Bruin makes their ability to challenge gun laws so much stronger uh, and their likelihood of victory so much greater, 
that courts are often now imposing um, uh, a temporary, basically enjoining the law from going into effect pending the outcome of litigation. So I think it's actually more like lawmakers can pass a law regulating guns right now. Um, but it's uh, unlikely that law is going to go into effect for several years because of uh, litigation. OK, so how do they sue for a law that hasn't been passed yet? Well, it's simple. Uh, you know, if uh, the, they uh, the Supreme Court uh, jurisprudence allows you to go to court uh, and uh, enjoin a law that is about to go into effect, um, Obviously, it doesn't stop the law from going into effect so it's passed. until the date that— Okay, so it's passed. So you can't do it against a law. Once, But laws that are passed often say, okay, as of January 1st, Got it. 2024, right. this law will okay. go into effect. Okay. Lawyers can, once that law is enacted, can go to court and sue to stop the law from going into effect on day one on the grounds that right. if it went into effect, it would violate their constitutional rights. Right. So then some people may say, all right, we're going to play the long game. The courts change. Obviously, it's changed between 2023 and 2000. 2008 and then before 2008. So people could say we're going to play the long game, long game like you're talking about, and we'll fight this thing in the courts for years in the hopes that eventually the court sees things our way. There's a new court. That, that, is that part of the idea? I do think so. Um, the, I think that, uh, you know, if you are thinking about legislating in this area, you have to take cognizance of the dangerous minefield that is the courts right now uh, in light of the Bruin case. Uh, and you could be passing a law today in the hopes that, well, by the time it gets to the Supreme Court in three or four years, there'll be a different Supreme Court. The unfortunate uh, fact for gun safety advocates is that uh, the Supreme Court in three or four years is not likely to be uh, any significantly different from it is how it is today. The justices, by and large, skew very young. The six-member majority, uh, a uh, conservative majority on the Supreme Court that signed on to the Bruin case, it, it doesn't seem likely to have significant change anytime in the near future. I do think that gun safety advocates may be hoping that the Supreme Court will take another case pretty soon. And even though the court's very conservative, that Justices Kavanaugh and, Chief, and maybe Justice Barrett uh, and Chief Justice John Roberts might see that given how much uh, devastation the Bruin case is having in the lower courts to a lot of mainstream popular gun laws that no one ever really thought would be struck down, that maybe they'll uh, move to, uh, to lessen the test, lessen the burden on uh, gun safety advocates so that more laws might be upheld. Uh, that seems more likely than hoping for a change in the membership of the Supreme Court. So then, time. right, okay. So then one of those might be that Fifth Circuit decision that we just discussed, but there you probably see others on the horizon that might get to the level of the Supreme Court. Is that right? Yeah, but I would say that I think for gun safety advocates, the Fifth Circuit case is the best case that okay. could go to the Supreme Court because, you know, justices are human beings. Uh, and despite what you, what you, you know, the black robes that try to depersonalize them. Um, and I, I think that a lot of justices on whatever their jurisprudential beliefs or conservative or liberal uh, opinions are going to be really troubled by a test that says that we can't ban domestic abusers from having access to firearms, especially when the history and tradition of, uh, of such laws, it, it doesn't exist. Uh, and that's going to make them have second thoughts about that history and tradition test. Whereas I think a ban on assault weapons or a ban on high capacity magazines is the kind of law that yeah, you might find six justices very happy to say that law is unconstitutional and shouldn't exist. Uh, they are, uh, like it or not, they are still kind of outlier laws that are only in place in a a few states, uh, a handful of states, um, whereas the domestic abuser ban is the kind of thing that we think of as um, uh, every state should ban and uh, right, federal but law. In order to make, it, to make that change, they would have to essentially change that second test enough, which could reflect on a whole bunch of other laws as well. 
Absolutely. No, I think they would have to uh, adjust the test either by saying uh, history and tradition is not the exclusive way to do it, or they'd have to say that in doing the history and tradition test, you look at uh, the history of laws at a very high level of generality uh, and say, well, yeah, you can ban domestic abusers because we banned um, uh, racial minorities and Indians uh, from having guns in uh, the early 17 and 1800s. Note, by the way, that that's an uncomfortable kind of analogy to make to right. sort of look at the laws of the 17 and 1800s that are based in racism and say, well, that that shows that government had the power to ban guns back in the day. But that's what you kind of have to do in right. this history and tradition test because the Supreme Court has forced you to only look to history and tradition to justify a law. And then, as you were saying before, there are all these people set up, maybe universities or think tanks, who are sending in the historical precedents, but not every one of those gets to be read at this, by the Supreme Court justices, right? So who determines who's reading the materials? In a sense, it's like lobbying, right? Because your materials, you're trying to convince them of an argument on each side. So they get these materials, and who decides what they're getting? Well, by the time it goes to the Supreme Court, it's gone through several courts, uh, and the briefing has happened. I mean, we do have uh, an adversarial legal system where, like lobbying, you could say, uh, we rely on the advocates to bring evidence to court, um, and courts do not independently go out and seek their own evidence or hire their own experts. Right. Um, as they might do in some other civil law systems in Europe, for instance. Uh, but we depend on advocates to come bring that evidence to the courts. Uh, and by the time it gets to the Supreme Court, you're hoping that much, much of that evidence has gone through briefing at the lower courts in several levels. But by the time you get to the Supreme Court, you also get a lot of amicus briefs that are going to be filled with history that has not been really vetted by anyone. And it, right. So in, that's, so in other words, then by that time when the Supreme Court says, I'm going to hear this, and they give, what is it, like a year notice that they're going to hear this or eight months notice? How far in advance? You know, it depends on the case, but it's about six months. Six months. And then, but then a whole network gets set up of people who say, OK, they're going to hear this. Let's get to work. Johns Hopkins University, or I'm making that up, but not really, but whoever it might be who's sending it along, that becomes a whole ecosystem. Yeah, and there is a whole ecosystem. The briefing of a Supreme Court case is actually an interesting phenomenon, sort of way beyond maybe uh, your your listeners' real interest. But yeah, there are big, you know, we, amicus briefs are in, in big cases now. You often get uh, 50 to 75 amicus briefs in the biggest high profile cases. Uh, and often this is coordinated right. where uh, advocates seek out and have big meetings of all the different ad groups right. that want to participate and different policies are, and different arguments are assigned to different briefs. And uh, there's a lot uh, of organization and, as you call it, lobbying that goes on in Supreme Court cases. Right. For example, when they were doing the um, the abortion rights case, Jackson, Mississippi, I think it was, last year, uh, and that was the Center for Reproductive Rights was, I think, the, was involved in that case. And they took messaging advice from lots of people. There were lots of groups set up to help on messaging f before that case was heard. So it becomes a whole world of people. And I think, you know, for a layman, not you, but for a layman, that is a fascinating world that most people don't know anything about at all. So I think we could probably spend another hour just on that. But uh, so then if you're a gun safety organization and you want to make a difference in the overwhelming number of gun deaths and injuries and gun violence we have in this country, what would be, uh, what should be the priorities for the next couple of years? Well, I think for the, I think it's really important that gun safety advocates prioritize laws that have uh, a strong likelihood of being upheld in the courts. And so I would uh, recommend avoiding certain kinds of laws like high capacity magazine bans or bans on assault weapons right now, and instead focus on coming up with best practices for community intervention programs. Um, I don't think, uh, you know, there's a lot more money going into that space now. There's even been some articles about how maybe there's too much money going into that space based on the level of expertise in the area. But uh, there's good money going into community intervention programs like Operation Ceasefire that 
have a proven track record of success. What you need now is um, uh, focusing on best practices to make that work. Uh, I think we need to do more in the mental health space, do more in um, taking the current gun laws we have and making them stronger in terms of um, cracking down on gun trafficking, doing more to identify and confiscate guns from people who are uh, clearly prohibited purchasers under laws that are already in existence right. and, uh, and good laws, uh, improve the reporting uh, for background checks. Um, I think that's probably where to spend uh, the most time, um, but uh, um, part of the difficulty is that many in the gun safety um, uh, sort of mobilized community really want bans on assault weapons and high-capacity magazines. And probably more uh, in some cases, right, in terms of yeah. banning weapons, for sure. I mean, absolutely. But, but you know, what's interesting, and now that I think of it is, in Wisconsin, they're having some big fight over uh, judges. They're, they're elected in Wisconsin. And I guess if you're on a gun rights or gun safety side and judges are elected, you may want to get involved in that fight. Because if they're making the decisions on what's going to be legal or not, then that might be an area that some of these gun rights and gun safety organizations want. Uh, they're in, I'm sure they're in it in some ways now. But that might be an area as well. Sure. You know, you want to fight your fights on multiple fronts. And uh, state uh, Supreme Courts are an important space for um, um, the protection of legal rights. Um, of course, in the Second Amendment space in particular, so long as the Supreme Court's test is uh, really difficult for gun laws to meet, um, it almost doesn't matter what happens in Wisconsin and the Supreme Court there, because any gun law can adopted in Wisconsin can be challenged under in the federal courts uh, for violating the Second Amendment. But uh, I think you're right. But advocates definitely want to focus on all spaces. And you can be sure that gun rights advocates are focusing on the Wisconsin Supreme Court right. uh, and uh, abortion rights advocates right. and abortion right. foes. Right. And um, uh, it's one of the unfortunate side effects of having elected judges is Which should that, not, that it is becomes just a seems partisan so yeah. uh, and political issue. Right. It seems so weird. So you, as an expert in your field, there's probably a question you get a lot that gets on the annoys you. I'm guessing. Is that correct? Is there like one question that you get that you say, we don't even need to be asking this question? Yes. Okay. Tell me what it is. <laughs> Almost every time I give a public lecture, someone will ask me, why is it we don't restrict automatic weapons? And why does this question bother you? Well, it bothers me for two reasons. Number one, the, the premise is incorrect. We actually have, since the 1980s, prohibited the sale of new automatic weapons, uh, that uh, automatic weapons have been subject to extensive regulation and special permitting requirements going all the way back to the 1930s. Um, so its premise is wrong. Uh, but two, it also reflects a widespread misunderstanding that many people in the gun safety world, and I don't mean at the gun safety institutions or organizations or activists who are really knowledgeable in this space, but many people that are part of that population, uh, the general population who support gun safety reform, they actually think that, um, uh, that assault weapons are automatic weapons. Uh, that is, that they fire multiple rounds of ammunition with just a single pull of the trigger, when that's not what they do. Uh, and uh, and so I, I think part of the thing that I'm hoping for is, is that um, just as I hope for people in the gun rights advocacy world to um, uh, to to accept the legitimacy of modern forms of gun safety reform, I also would hope that many people in the gun safety community would learn a little bit more about guns yeah. so that they're not pushing for laws and advocating for things that actually don't make a lot of sense. Well, it's and interesting you say that because I was uh, meeting with a congressional staffer the other day, and I said, she, they were talking about an assault weapons ban. And I said, well, how many of the 45,000 or so deaths a year do you think are with what you would call an assault weapon? And do you know what her answer was, Professor Winkler? I'll tell you, 40%, right? And I said it's- right, uh, it's, I think it's less than 4%. Right, right. it's 3% of the 25,000 homicides, 20,000 homicides, it's about 1% of total. And she did not believe that. The, I'll, I, I'll say on the gun safety side, 
the thing that I, I hear from people just anecdotally a lot is, why don't we do what they did in Australia? And just ban guns completely like in Australia. Do you ever, people ever say that to you? They must, right? All the time. Right, right, right. And when you try to explain to people that we have the Second Amendment in this country and there are 400 million guns in this country, it hasn't really been thought through, is what I'll say. Very often. And Australia is a really interesting case um, because in Australia, they didn't get rid of all the guns. They had a, a gun stock of about 3 million guns in civilian hands uh, when they passed that extensive gun regulation after a mass shooting. I guess it's almost 20 years ago now. And that led to a big buyback of certain kinds of weapons and a prohibition on the sale of certain kinds of, uh, of, of firearms. The buyback bought back about 800,000 firearms, so leaving about 2.2 million firearms in civilian hands. Ordinary handguns, for instance, hunting rifles, et cetera. Um, and in the 20 years since that law was adopted, the current data show that uh, all those guns have been restocked, that they're over 3 million guns again in oh, Australia. Uh, and given that it, you can have a mass shooting with any gun, including any of those three million guns that are in Australia, it's hard for me to think that it's solely because the gun law that was adopted 20 years ago that uh, Australia hasn't had any mass shootings. It just, the logic doesn't seem to really add up, even though there is a correlation there. But, you know, uh, uh, in statistics, we always say that, you know, a correlation is not causation. You need a right. theory for why what we have, what happens is happening that makes sense logically. And I, I don't think the, given the amount of guns that are back in civilian hands in Australia, Australia, that uh, the Australian miracle is solely a matter of gun reform. Um, that may be an important part of it, and I'm not saying we shouldn't consider it for our own country, but we are in a very different space. Right now, we have gun laws being struck down left and right. We're not at the stage where we can adopt significant reforms that are going to in any way inhibit the gun stock that we have. The people in your class at UCLA, how often do you teach the class at UCLA? I teach gun classes all the time. Um, uh, I also integrate gun and Second Amendment stuff into constitutional law classes and whatnot. So um, uh, it's always a great topic for debate and discussion. The kid, the students in the class, they probably come in not knowing a ton. So the education that they're getting here is very, very unique. I can't think of, you know, we know Professor Yamane at Wake Forest, for example, but there aren't that many people who do anything like what you do, I would think. So you don't need to, I'll praise you, you don't have to say anything. Um, but that must be, is this the dream, are you basically, in your aside from being general manager of the Dodgers, is this basically your dream career? You know, uh, just on personal level, I, I feel I found a loophole in life where <laughs> I just found a perfect job that is great to me. Um, being a, a, a professor at a major research university is uh, just a great, great honor. It's a it's a good lifestyle. Um, I, I get to. Um, work on, for the most part, the issues that I'm interested in working on rather than what someone else wants me to work on. Um, and uh, I get the opportunity to uh, engage with the public, uh, do podcasts, do these kinds of Zooms and webinars and things where um, uh, I feel like I can connect with a lot of people and share um, the knowledge that you, you kind of have to be a nerdy law professor to really have. <laughs> but other people might be interested in at least little bits of it. It's fantastic. Really amazing. So so uh, I suspect that you're going to be busy for a long time going forward because it just seems as if there are so many changes on the state level, the federal level, so many laws being brought up, so many laws being struck down. So I suspect you're really going to have your hands full. Uh, usually toward the end of these podcasts, Professor, we ask our guests to tag another guest who they think we should speak with. Would you have somebody in mind who you would like to see as a guest on tag? I do, I guess. Uh, one person I might think about is Christopher Smith. Now, Christopher Smith is a lawyer with the Bronx Public Defender's Office. And oh. um, the Bronx Public Defender's Office was part of a really interesting brief in the Bruin case that I thought was really groundbreaking. Um, you might think that the Bronx Public Defenders that spends a lot of time representing people of color might be in support of gun safety regulation, but and I'm sure they are, uh, but they filed a really interesting amicus brief in the Bruin case, arguing that the Supreme Court should strike down New York's 
permitting policy for concealed carry. And the reason why was not because they thought the history and tradition of gun laws led to that result. Rather, they argued that uh, it was communities of color who were really being adversely impacted by certain gun laws that we have on the books today. And what that brief really opened my eyes to was an element of gun safety reform that I hadn't really thought that much about. I'd written about the racist history of gun control and the effects of gun laws on uh, communities of color. Um, but it was really striking that uh, often in the gun safety community, uh, there's a real push for increased criminalization, making more things a crime, adding more years of punishment and sentencing to gun crimes. Um, but it was really interesting to see the Bronx public defenders come and sort of break through that a little yeah, bit and say, hey, you know, if you're interested in criminal justice reform, you have to be thinking about gun reform as well in that space. And so I just thought that was a really interesting perspective that kind of has shifted the ground a little bit in the Second Amendment uh, world, showing that there's actually actually a strong progressive argument for decriminalization, even of certain kinds of gun laws, that I thought was really interesting. When that happens, when you see something that interesting, do you get in touch with the person? Uh, sometimes I will, depending on whether uh, I have good reason to uh, to get in touch with someone. Um, uh, I had uh, the good fortune to meet some of the people from the Bronx Public Defender's Office at an academic conference uh, last year that talked about some of these issues. And I, I certainly learned a, a lot about it and have written a little bit since then on how the Supreme Court, now that it's doing history and tradition analysis, how should it deal with the fact that there is this long racist history of gun laws? Well, thank you, Professor. We You've learned a lot. Your appearance here is much appreciated. Hope to talk to you soon more about the Supreme Court. And thank you very much for joining us on TAG. Thanks so much for having me. And now for Dr. Siegel with Siegel Scope. Thanks, Matt. Today, on this edition of Siegel Scope, I want to address the question of why is it that we are trying to bring together gun owners? and non-gun owners. And why do we think this will make a difference? Well, to answer this question, I have to take you back to my work with uh, the anti-tobacco coalitions. Um, starting early in my career, um, I dedicated most of my, my early career to fighting the tobacco industry. And if you go back about 30 years ago, the situation with the tobacco industry was very much the same as it is today with the gun issue. You had a very powerful tobacco industry that had tremendous influence over Congress. Uh, almost nothing was being done at the, at the federal level. You had uh, a complete polarization between smokers and non-smokers. Um, you have confrontations between smokers and non-smokers in public places. And um, it was really, the tobacco industry really portrayed this as an issue of smokers' rights versus public health, just as the NRA is portraying the gun debate as gun rights versus public health. So the, the similarities were very strong, uh, but something changed in tobacco control, which led to uh, where we are now, which is incredibly um, major changes. The tobacco industry has lost a great deal of its influence. Um, and we now have uh, federal legislation in 2009 that essentially regulates the entire tobacco industry and all of its actions, including its advertising and promotion. Uh, and that was clearly bipartisan legislation that was supported by both parties and by people on all sides of the issue. So we truly did break the impasse. We broke the polarization. We broke the divide. What broke that was the fact that we changed the debate. We changed the terms of the debate from one between smokers against non-smokers to one between the public, smokers and non-smokers alike, and the tobacco industry. We found where the common ground was between smokers and non-smokers. Nobody wanted to see people die from smoking. Uh, smokers certainly didn't want to see that. Non-smokers didn't want to see that. 
Um, nobody thought that people should have to be exposed to high levels of secondhand smoke in their jobs. Everybody thought that we should put money towards uh, helping to find a cure for smoking related diseases for helping to treat those diseases. And we hit on a common agenda that was supported by both smokers and non-smokers. And as a result, um, the cloud of the tobacco industry went down. They were no longer successful in framing the debate as just being smokers versus non-smokers. It was really now the public, the entire public taking on big tobacco and, and the public ended up winning. Uh, first at the local level where the tobacco industry had very in, little influence, then moving up to the state level, and then finally culminating in congressional legislation in 2009. And since that time, smoking rates have pretty much plummeted uh, to their all time historic lows. Why do I think that this can work with the gun issue? Well, it's pretty much an analogous issue highly polarized. Um, you have a gun lobby that has tremendous amount of political power, especially at the federal level, much less power at the local level and at the state level. Uh, and you have a, a polarized field, which the gun lobby has successfully portrayed as being gun owners versus non-gun owners. But just as it was with tobacco, where there was a lot of common ground between smokers and non-smokers, we have found that there is a lot of common ground between gun owners and non-gun owners. And in fact, everyone, all of us, gun owner, non-gun owner, doesn't matter. Uh, none of us wanna see people dying from gun violence. Everyone wants to find a solution to this problem. And we found through our research that if we listen to gun owners, listen to what they have to say, take advantage of their expertise, pay attention to their specific concerns about the details of legislation, we can forge a pathway based on the common ground, which leads to uh, effective solutions that can be supported by both sides, that the public as a whole can support. It's not a question of having uh, one party or the other. It's bipartisan policy that pretty much everyone agrees with. And so that's why we think it's so important to bring, bring gun owners into the debate. We need to end the portrayal of this debate as gun owners versus non-gun owners, where we have this intractable divide. And that's why we feel it's so important to bring gun owners and non-gun owners together. And we think like with tobacco, where we now have an industry that has very little influence over Congress, we have bipartisan legislation that is truly taken on the tobacco issue from its very roots. Um, we believe that the same thing can happen with the gun issue and that we are not far from the day where um, the public demands action and Congress and state legislatures will take that action because the demand is coming not from one side or the other, but from everyone. Thanks for listening to another edition of Siegel Scope. And it's back to you, Matt. I'm Matthew Lippman, your host of TAG. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. If you did, we'd love for you to subscribe, give us a five-star rating, and tell your friends about us. You can find more episodes of TAG on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you like to listen to your podcasts. Give us a follow on Instagram and Twitter at 97%org and tag who you'd like us to chat with next. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you soon.